Hello, Facebookers. Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to Health Hackers. Episode number 10, I'm Gemma Evans. I'm a television journalist and presenter here in the UK. And this is my series devoted to interviewing the most pioneering and influential figures in health, fitness and wellness right now. And today I am with Professor Tim Noakes. Thank you, Gemma. It's a great privilege to be here. Thank you. Professor Noakes, if you haven't heard of him, uh, he's kind of a big deal in the low-carb movement. That's the high-fat, low-carb eating movement. And he's been a sports scientist for his entire career. And we're going to be talking right. all things low-carb, high-fat for the next 30 minutes. We're going to be talking about Tim's journey and the whole eating plan if, and the whole eating movement, if you've not been that familiar with it just pop your questions in the comment section i've got my laptop here so if you see me looking down lots i'm not being rude i'm looking at everything you're saying and all your comments and your questions so i can put your comments and questions to tim so let's get started by um having a little chat about how you became such a big name in this arena because i've been describing you to people mm. who didn't know about you as this guy that used to do ultra marathons was an expert on sports science, ate loads of carbs, advised eating loads of carbs, then did a U-turn, and now doesn't touch carbs. <laughs> Can you fill in the gaps for us on how that, how that came to be? So the gaps were that I finished my medical training in 1975, and the next year, 76, 77, the dietary guidelines changed. And at the same time, new ideas came into sports science that carbohydrates were terribly important. Mm -hmm. So you had this kind of double drive. If you're an athlete, you must eat carbs. And if you want to prevent heart disease, you must also avoid the fats and eat carbs. Yeah, that low-fat, higher-carb yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So now I'm working in a cardiology unit doing my research, and, and my professor is the best-known cardiologist in South Africa. Uh, am I going to tell him he's wrong? Of course. Oh, you just accepted it. So I accepted right. it. And only in 2010 did I suddenly realize I got it all wrong. Fortunately, I was fat, I was diabetic. I didn't realize it at the time, but I made the diagnosis subsequently. My running had gone terrible. And I went out to run one morning, had a terrible run and came home. And then on my emails was an invitation to purchase the book, The New Atkins for the New You. And so I was so angry because... And that was the famous, what became the famous Atkins diet, right? Yeah. So you see this in an email... That's and you're great. furious. I'm furious because I know the scientists and they are selling out to Atkins. So I went to buy the book because I wanted to write to them and you tell them they're a disgrace. It. Wow, really? Yeah. Uh, that you're a disgrace. Because you thought, how could they, if anyone is not familiar with Atkins, it's, it's a kind of no carb plan. It's just like lots of meats and proteins. Um, so, and you were such a big carb fan. You're furious, about to write a letter of complaint, but you read the book. I read the book, and in two hours, I realized I got it all wrong. Two hours. Because wow. it said there's 150 studies of low-carbohydrate diets published in decent journals, and they all show benefit. And then I could see, hold it, I was the guy they were writing this book yeah. for. I'm the insulin-resistant diabetic, oh. you see. So you were, you were diabetic at this point? Yeah, but I didn't, hadn't actually made the diagnosis, but yes, I was. I'd probably okay. been diabetic for two or three years already. Yeah. So then you're at this point where you suddenly realize you've made a mistake mm. well, what do you do then and what about all the runners you'd been advising all the athletes <laughs> telling right. them to eat high carbs you were even producing an energy glucose gel weren't you correct well wow. we had we engineered it and did, designed it and so on and we prom promoted it for for 20 years or so yeah and so then and so now how are you explaining this to the running community You're well like, firstly i had to make sure that i was right right so okay. anyway i converted to the diet i said that's the end of carbs for me it was really easy because that's the diet i was raised on i'm my parents are from the north of England, and my mother was, her father was a major exporter of meat from Liverpool to, to New York. So I, she'd always raised me on high, so in high meat diet. Yeah. High so meat I think I'm a real carnivore. So anyway, I converted and in, I started losing weight immediately. And in six weeks, my running had gone back to what I was running when I was 40. So I was 60 then. I'd gone back to where I was at 40. I mean, if you... It was just astonishing. I've dropped like two minutes a kilometer on some runs. Wow. And it was like I was, I felt like I was back to 40 or even 30. And it was amazing because when you've been in this dark area, when you're re running is terrible and you can't run and now you can suddenly run again. Yeah. So, so then I knew that I was onto something. And I said, well, I'm obviously not going to change back. Then I discovered I had diabetes. And eventually the story slowly got out in South Africa. Here's a guy who was the high carb man. He's now telling us to eat a high fat He's diet. He's now the low carb. And then I got fat. targeted because I started writing stuff about statins aren't any good and cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. 
So initially I got hot targeted by them, but then the dietitians came along and they didn't like what I was saying, so they told yeah, me. Yeah, we'll talk about some of your critics yeah. a bit later because yeah. Tim is a pretty controversial figure. And, um, you know, most people in the public eye, they all have their critics. So <laughs> I always love to hear responses from those people. Um, now, I've heard you say before that runners and athletes now who do eat high-carb diets, you've actually said that they are hurting themselves. What do you mean by that? Well, what I now realize, the majority of us are insulin resistant. And certainly you may not recognize it until you get to 50 or 60 like but what I does do. that, what does that look like, insulin resistance? If okay, someone people who put, typically you put on weight okay. as you get older and you get crotchety <laughs> and you, you get hangry and you tend to fall asleep in the afternoon. And as I've indicated, your, your weight starts to increase, your, your belt size gets bigger. Okay. All those, those are classic signs. But your mood changes and you don't have the same energy and so on. And again, the falling asleep, which was something I typically did. I would fall asleep at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. Mm. And when I was driving, my wife noticed I, could, I would have to sleep while I was driving. Okay. I'd have to stop. So those are all markers of insulin resistance. Mm. And then, so the majority of us will become insulin resistant if we're not already that. So, so if, and the more carbohydrates you eat, the quicker you'll become more seriously insulin resistant. So we've been promoting this high carbohydrate diet, which you can get away with for four or five years or six years. Then your performance starts to drop but you don't realize it. And then four or five years later, you get more of the signs of insulin resistance. And then 20 years later, you get diabetes. So that's how you would say athletes are hurting themselves. Yeah. But not just athletes, all of us. Oh, correct. I Most mean, if, if you go to the London Marathon, is yeah. everyone lean like the Kenyans who are winning? No, they're not. There's many fat people in the London Marathon, and they've been told to eat lots of carbs, and that's completely wrong. If, uh, you're, a, if you're a recreational athlete, you can get all the energy you need from fat, and you'll be much healthier burning fat than burning carbohydrate. Um, Richard says, was it hard to gain people's trust when you did your U-turn? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm still battling. Um, the beauty of this conference that we're at today is it's, it, it's been, I've been so well accepted, mm -hmm. but I'm not that well accepted elsewhere. Yeah, and that conference that we're at right now, we're at the Royal College of GPs where they're holding the annual public health collaboration conference. Um, Tim did a speech earlier all about challenging conventional dietary guidelines. And we can talk about a bit more about that now because I, I'd love to know what you think is the biggest mistake that we are all making. And is it as simple as we just eat too many carbs or is it sugar well, or is it exercise? <laughs> it's not exercise. The biggest mistake we're making right is now is not that us. we're doing physically that we're physically inactive because mm -hmm. so many of us are not physically inactive and yet we still get sick. So the physical inactivity can't make up for the bad diet. The thing we do is we wake up in the morning and we eat a high carbohydrate breakfast, a high sugary breakfast with cereals, skim milk, banana, and that's catastrophe because that sets you up for hunger three hours later. So now you've got to eat something else and you're away from home. So what are you going to eat? It's going to be convenient food. And so you're snacking all the time. So the biggest thing we do is eating three meals a day and snacking. Mm. If you want to sort out your health, you have to eat a high-fat, high-protein breakfast, eggs, bacon, whatever else, mm -hmm. but high-fat cheese, yogurt that hasn't got sugar in it. And that sh you've got to eat once. That's, if that's your big meal, then, then you have a smaller meal in the evening. If that's a small meal, then you have your big meal in the evening. Mm. And that's it. And you don't eat the rest of the day. So you need to keep your blood insulin levels down. Every time you eat carbohydrates, you spike them and you get hungry and you have to eat again. And then you can have the effects of the insulin resistance. That's correct. Yeah. See, so I was actually ketogenic, so really, really super low carb mm. for about four years. And I was, I'd still get hangry later mm. on. So I, whereas you, <laughs> you were having like one big meal and then a mm. couple of smaller meals. I was having one big meal, four hours later, another big meal, four hours later, another big meal. I mean, I didn't put on masses yeah, of weight, yeah, sure. and I, I was still in ketosis because I was measuring blood ketones, but I, it didn't destroy the hunger yeah, for me. No, that's really interesting. It's, that's fascinating. Do you think but, some people are just different? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are people who put on weight on this diet. Yeah. You know, there are 10% of people on this low-carb diet will put on weight, and, and we realize there's something else going on in the brain, and for them, they still continue to eat too many calories for most of us we just lose hunger so i had a big breakfast this morning and i won't be hungry again until this evening so. yeah we are recording this in the lunch break here because uh, um i was told that tim doesn't need lunch so he can come and do the facebook live right now which has been great <laughs> <laughs> um so i've got some more questions here eve wants to know is the, oh this is my mum my mum wants to know, is the high-fat diet advisable for the over 65s? Because her father is 92 today. Happy birthday, Grandpa. And he's very active and healthy, but he seems to thrive on cocoa and biscuits. 
And she also makes the point that a lot of nursing homes for the elderly have a lot of cakes and biscuits. Well, the, the nursing home is the last place you want to be too light to live because you get such terrible diets. And then you, the Alzheimer's just is promoted by this high carbohydrate diet. So your granddad is very fortunate. He must be profoundly insulin sensitive to get away with it for 92 really? years. He is really lean yeah, as well. Ex yeah. Exactly. And he may have eaten a high meat diet in, his, in the earlier years. But he shouldn't be converting. The older you are, the more fat you need to eat because fat's really needed for the brain function. For the brain function. And that's, at, at, at 92, the organ you're really wanting to look after is your brain. So we need good fats. Remind yeah. us of some of those good, healthful fats. Well, any animal fats are good, and that's the first thing. It's all the, the, the vegetable oils that are man-made, industrially made and industrially extracted that are bad. So the margarine that the Heart Foundation tells us is healthy is, is not. It's killing us. We just mustn't eat margarine and vegetable oils, and you mustn't cook with vegetable it's oils. It's quite a either. statement to say margarine is yeah. killing us. Yeah. No, is that well, but is it, but you, that's your view because of the omega-6 inflammatory yeah. oils? And, but the evidence is there that, that if you're over 65 and you're eating vegetable oils, you, your mortality is increased. That's, that's the evidence. Uh, Dave says, is starting the day with a protein shake mixed with full-fat milk a good start to the day? Yeah, Dave, that's a really good start. I, I don't know why you can't put an egg instead of the protein shake. You see, the egg has got much more nutrients than the protein can shake. Can you add an egg? You yeah, can have absolutely. Shake, yeah, egg, yeah. Add, bit of but, milk. but add two or three. <laughs> two or so three you, must, you must look at the protein shake and you'll see it's made up of all sorts of stuff. It's highly processed and a lot of it is not healthy. So you're much better to take nature's vitamin pill, which is an egg. Um, do you advise, because I'm interested in this, do you advise a low carb high fat diet if you wanted to do weight lifting absolutely because so, I, I used to have this trainer yeah. who said to me you've got you have got to eat carbs before you come and lift weights yeah. okay well i'm not going to take my shirt off and show you the five kilograms of muscle i put on <laughs> you put it on when you stopped <laughs> at eating 68 carbs. no at 68 i converted to now running less and doing more gym work yeah and i've just exploded Let, and that, that's, that's 68 and, and when and, you... And I wouldn't... If I'd been eating high carbs, I wouldn't have done it because I couldn't do the training. You know, you first you've got to be able to do the training. And that's the high-fat diet allows you to do the training at 68. At 68, if you're eating a high-carb diet and you're like me, insulin resistant, you won't do the exercise. You just can't... So I get really hungry before working out, but I yeah. know some people, probably like you, exercise yeah. in a fasted state. Yeah, almost. Yeah. If, if you're really hungry like me before a workout, what would you eat? No, you... But no, you're... <laughs> <laughs> or I You've got to sort out that hunger issue. Yeah. Get, right, You've okay. got to find the right fats that turn off your hunger, or the protein. Yeah. Some, some, a lot of people say it's protein that turns off your. For me, it's not. If I eat a high protein meal, I've got to go and find the fat afterwards to take away yeah, my. Hunger. Actually, but for yeah. other people, it's the protein. So what's happening is you're not eating. You haven't got the protein fat diet ratio mm. right in your diet. When I was in ketosis, I missed huge amounts of vegetables because I. If I was eating less than 22 grams of net carbs mm. a day, I couldn't have all the multicolored veggies that I yeah, eat yeah, now. Because yeah. I'd say my carbs now come from vegetables and fermented yogurt drinks, yeah, like that's kefir. Great. That's great. And that's probably where all my carbs come from. Yeah. And things like olives who do, yeah, have to, yeah. do have a bit of carbs in. But I, yeah, okay. Okay, so now just add some protein. I mean, and add see whether that will make a difference. All fat. But try the protein. Um... A lot of people say that low carb is dangerous and unhealthy because we should have a balanced diet, a bit of moderation of everything. And I have plenty of guests here on Health Hackers who say you've got to have this balanced diet and you've got to have a little bit of everything. Yeah. How do you respond to that? A balanced diet is a euphemism for this rubbishy diet that we're eating, the high sugar diet. That's, it's a euphemism, an industry drove it because it sounds good. Okay, so what's balanced? So humans do not need any carbohydrates. We have zero requirement for carbohydrate. And then what is this diet? They tell you it's got 60% carbohydrate. So they tell you that's balanced. How can a diet be balanced when it contains 60% of a nutrient you do not need one gram of? It can't be. So you, what you have to ask the question is, so tell me, dietitian, what are we balancing? Are we balancing micronutrients? Ma macronutrients? Well, we can't be because it's 60%, you know, 10%, 30%. How can that be balanced? Mm -hmm. Or 60, 20, 20, that's not balanced. It's 30, 30, 30 might be balanced. Are you balancing the zinc intake or the iron intake or something? It's, it's utter no, garbage. And moderation means that what that means is oh, what you're eating now is fine because there's no person who will tell you they're not eating in moderation. So if, I've, if I'm drinking three glasses of alcohol a day, I will say that's moderation. 
Or if it's six glasses, it'll be moderation. Mm. If I've got 10 teaspoons of sugar a day, I'll say, well, of course that's moderate because that's what I do. So moderation means I don't have to change. And it also means, oh, yes, you can take the sugar because, it's, okay, it's going to kill you, but as long as you eat it in moderation, it's not going to kill you. So that's how, that's how industry works. Industry is driving this argument it's and using the terminology, and then they, it becomes part of the lexicon. Mm-hmm. And we don't, under, we don't analyze it carefully enough. So ca- analyze what has balanced me. And what is moderation? Moderation, you cannot define moderation. There's no scientific word for moderation. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's meaningless. And all it means is you don't have to change. That's what it means. Uh, there's a trend at the moment that seems to be promoting plant-based foods. Yeah, um, very strong. And, and I just wonder where, what you think about that, because I know that you're a big mm. advocate of eating meat. Mm. So where do you think this plant-based uh, It's again, it's industry. Idea it's is industry going. driving it. So you mean the kind of the companies behind yeah. plant-based foods? Well, it's mainly the vegetable oil industry, because they've been driving the dietary guidelines with the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists are a plant-based religion and they're anti-meat they say meat causes cancer and meat causes environmental change and they've been driving the dietary guidelines in the united states since 1917 they're the only religion which has a an, an, an arm that promotes different diets but this can't be worldwide it is it is worldwide because the dietary guidelines come from america and the British and the South Africans just follow they follow that is because we assume that the, British, the Americans mm. know what they're doing. So that's the problem. So the plant-based is now, it's the industry is fighting back against the animal-based diets because they're trying to say, oh, we're going to destroy the environment by not eat, we're eating too much meat. But that argument has, has never been properly argued because if you're going to eat a plant-based diet, then we're going to make the country, the world unhealthy. We're going to have diabetes, obesity rates that have gone through the roof. Can you Se- eat seventy percent? Sorry, seventy percent of the current diet is plant-based. Of that, of the global food that is being eaten, seventy percent is plant-based. So we're already eating a plant-based diet. Are we healthy? No, we aren't. What if you ate? Lo- what if you ate plant-based, low carb? Could you be healthy? I don't know if, yeah, yeah. But the problem with plant-based is that the proteins are not as healthy as meat-based proteins mm. or fish and eggs. That's the problem. That they're not perfect protein. What about um, the studies that show that too much red meat is carcinogenic and causes okay, cancer? Okay, that's completely fallacious. There is no such evidence. The only t- evidence we can use is randomized controlled trials, and those are not randomized controlled trials. They're associational studies. They're coming out of Harvard, and there are three scientists at Harvard who are plant-based, paid by the plant-based industry to produce this nonsense. And they've been doing it for the last 30 years. So most nutritional science is nonsense. Because it's association. In other words, we look at a population and 40 years later we see what they died from and then we search through what they eat, what they reported they ate once upon a time. And we assume that they ate that the whole time. Now the problem is people who eat meat are different. They smoke more, they're less active, etc. Or they were historically. And therefore you can't detect whether it's the smoking or whatever that's causing the problem. The only evidence that we have is randomized controlled trials and there are no randomized controlled trials of meat. Even if meat causes cancer, the risk is one in a hundred. One person in a hundred might increase their risk of cancer of the bowel by one in a hundred. Now, if that person stops eating bacon, they'll start eating other foods. What will they eat? They'll eat carbohydrates. What are they going to do with carbohydrates? They're going to get diabetes. So that's, you, the problem is you can't isolate a single food and then say, okay, well, if you took it out, then this is going to happen. You're going to be healthier. No, you don't know that. But aren't you doing that with carbs? Isn't that what they might say? Yeah, but, but, what, but what we're doing is we're going to a diet that was eaten in the 1960s or before that. And in 1960s, we were healthy. And the British were the healthiest in 1850, between 1850 and 1870. Really? They were the healthiest. They had the life expectancy that they have today, and they were healthy. They were lean. They were not dying of heart disease, of cancer, or autoimmune disease. All those diseases are linked to processed foods, and particularly wheat, vegetable oils, and sugar. That's what's killing us. Do you think that some... That, or do you have some sympathy for the idea that everybody is totally unique? No, they aren't. No, we all come from a population of 6,000 people that lived in South Africa about 200,000 years ago. So genetically, we're much closer than we think. Yeah. But, so but, I, but having, said yeah, that, yeah. having said that, yes, we are individuals and we have to find out what works for us. But we're not un- uniquely different. We've got so, many, so much that is common. So I, I look at my dad. Okay? Yes. And he has so much bread. And I've talked yeah. to him about the right. benefits of a low-carb diet. And 
But he d- he just loves his bread. I reckon he has about a couple of slices of bread with every meal. Can I say he's got a bread he's got a bread addiction. Do you think he's got a, he's got a food but, addiction? Food with the, one of the great talks at this conference was about food addiction. We accept excuse me we accept sugar addiction, but there's also a carbohydrate addiction. And bread is highly addictive. So he's he eats a lot of bread, yeah. but he is lean and healthy. I'd say I know he's had a, a high blood pressure score once or twice, but everything else seems to be yeah, fine. Yeah. And he's in his late okay. 60s. So, so is he just lucky? He's one of the 10% you who think? can do it. Yeah. But he, but even if, if he was my patient, I would be checking a couple of things. And then yeah. I would see, are you insulin resistant? If you're not insulin resistant, that's fine. You carry on. But I wouldn't eat bread. I still think mm. you don't know what's going to happen to his brain in the, in, in the long term yeah, with all that yeah, bread. Yeah. Uh, what about starchy carbs? Because when I was in ketosis, a couple of female doctors said to me, uh, as a woman, Gemma, you should be eating some starchy carbs because it's better for your hormones. So they were telling me to eat sweet potatoes, even if it was just every three days. That's nonsense. I don't nonsense. Really? Yeah. You know, the, the biggest thing that, that's happened in South Africa with the dietary change is women are writing in, I had PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh-huh. I was told infertile, I'll never have a child, I'm now pregnant. Tell me. I've changed your diet and I'm now pregnant. If you, if you want to fall pregnant, you better eat fat. That's what's going to make you fall pregnant. Mm-hmm. And that's what rever- reverses your infertility. Yeah. Um, right, more questions here. So what uh, Richard wanted to know, um, do you think carbs have a place in energy at all when it comes to sport? Is there any place for carbs in sport? Yeah, or the, sprinting? Yeah, well, no, probably not in sprinting because you don't really do enough training to need the carbs. What you, where you need carbs probably is between events that last from half an hour to two hours. And I would, if I was dealing with a world-class athlete in that area, I would say, fine, keep, keep eating the carbs. Oh but really? When, so if it, it was like a, a squash match, you would you would say yeah. you can keep eating your carbs because you're going to have a if short you're a world class athlete. But if you if you're a recreational, no, you can do all of that on fat. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important that fat we can burn fat so successfully that we can do most activities at a recreational level. But it's only when you're elite world class athlete for that short those duration of activity. Once you go beyond four hours, you better be on a high fat diet because that's going to make you a much better athlete. Um, tell us about your dad, because in your or yeah. in Tim's speech earlier, he discussed uh, the effect that the death of your father had mm. on you and what you learned from that, because I don't think many people know about your yeah, dad's exactly. health. So I'm 68. My dad was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at 68, but that was in the 1980s, and the management was bad. They only could test glu- glucose in the urine so that they undertreated the patients. Sorry, not the treatment works, but they, they, you, you, all you were told was, just make sure you've got glucose uh, by your side so that you can eat it when you need it. Yeah. And he would have given, given some pills to take, but there was no proper monitoring. But he was told to eat a high carbohydrate diet. And he died 10 years later, lost both his legs, had strokes, couldn't speak to me when he died. It's awful. Diabetes is the worst death you can possibly have. And he died because of the treatment. He didn't. You, diabetes doesn't kill you. Insulin resistant doesn't kill you. It's the management of the disease that kills you. You have to keep your glucose and insulin as low as possible. So I'm very proud. I've reversed my type 2 diabetes up to seven years. It's taken me seven years, and now I'm diabetes-free. I do and, take and medication. And you'd say you reversed yours by cutting out carbohydrates. Yeah, but I was religious, 25 grams a day, carbohydrate 25. maximum. Yeah. So no sugar, no sugar, no vegetable oils, no processed foods, but carbs, 25 grams a day. And my control has inched better and better and better over seven years. It's been... If from year to year, the change was small. Mm. But over seven years, I finally made it. Yeah. I, when I was ketogenic, I was probably, my max was about 24 net carbs yeah, a day. And, but, but I felt I wasn't getting enough veg, vegetables. The, the, there's no evidence you need vegetables. I mean, I hate to say this, but oh, there's, no. No randomized, really? there's no randomized control trial. But they're so good for us. Who said so? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're I mean, so that, good for us. Yeah, but that again is, that's marketing. Do you eat any veg? Very little. I'm almost carnivorous, yeah. yeah. And what's your health like now? Well, it's pretty good. Um, I'm running a bit slower again, unfortunately. I've lost... But hang on, but you are 68. Yeah. You are 68. 68 and a half, We yeah. can allow a bit of, yeah, bit of slowness right. for the that's runner. Right. <laughs> um, but, I, but sorry, now I must go boast. Yeah. You see, so in the CrossFit, I, did, I entered the CrossFit you Games. You CrossFit? Yeah. Wow. So I entered the CrossFit Games competition, which is called the 18, 18 series. And I finished ninth in my category in South Africa. So, ninth? Yeah, and in fact... So yeah, how many were, were in the I, re, I'm not, I don't know. I don't want to know. But the, and I wow. was 2,000th in the world in my category for my age. So I'm, I'm looking pretty good. I must... You're doing something, right? Yeah, that's um, right. 
So let's talk a little. We, we said we'd come back to discussing some of your critics. Yeah, sure. So we've already addressed the whole idea yeah. about those who say you've got to be balanced. And yeah. uh, what about the people who say you've abandoned science? Oh, that's my great friend, Professor Ross Tucker, who, yeah. who was my PhD student. Well, I don't know. He actually abandoned science because he never. He's not a nutritionist. He knows nothing about nutrition. And he made some awful statements about me. And we kind of, <laughs> yeah, there were four, four of my PhD students, PhD students went against me and became trolls against me. So these are people that you trained? Yeah, I trained them. He trained them. He would not be where he is today if it had not been for my helping him get his PhD. And when he graduated, something went changed in the relationship. And uh, he cannot say that. We, I've written the book, The Real Meal Revolution, uh, and sorry, the, the new book, uh, which is uh, the, law, the of law of Nutrition. I presented, for Dr. Tucker's, he knows this, I presented nine days of testimony under trial, under oath, nine days of testimony, 6,000 pages of scientific evidence. I was cross-examined for three and a half days. They could find nothing wrong with what I'd said. Is that having no science? That is the first time in history that a scientist has come up and presented all the evidence supporting the low-carbohydrate diet and then he says there's no evidence. But please. Do you know, I, I, how do you stay so resilient? Because you can't... Yeah. I mean, the, that must hurt. It hurts a if lot. It's somebody, it hurts a lot. You know, I, he's a, 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 this, this gentleman, Ross Tucker, isn't here to give his yeah, side of the story. Sure. But, but if, if your view is that this is someone that you know and that, as with others, they've kind of <laughs> turned well. their back on yeah, you, yeah. I mean, that must really hurt. No, of course it hurts. It, it hurts a lot because he's a clever kid. But the reason why he does it, and uh, I'm not going to discuss them okay, here, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, Rob wants to know, um, I'd like to ask Tim whether he's ever doubted his new position, new position being the, the yeah. low-carb instead of the pro-carb, um, amid the criticism he's received over the last few years. Have you ever thought, God, I'm just going to no, just well, quit I mean, now? Sure, if, you know, if I was wrong, it would have been exposed in the trial. It wasn't. The, 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 the opposition, the prosecution, produced one scientific paper to compete with Oster there, because there is no evidence against we it. We should just say that the, the trial Tim's discussing uh, relates to some advice that was given on Twitter some years ago now, and then four, you, four you years, four years ago, and you were cleared of, uh, uh, over that. But then there's an appeal which we're still awaiting the announcement of now. But during this time, uh, Tim obviously became quite a controversial name for everything that you were saying and speaking up. And and yeah, like Rob says, yeah. did, did you ever did you ever think? Because no, you see, I'm, I I'm steeped in science. I'm steeped in science. I've challenged seven things in my life. I've been right on all of them. So I went into this one having known that I challenged science six times and been right. And the, I had to guess I was going to be right on the seventh because I looked at the evidence. And if you look at the evidence, then it's clear. And I presented that evidence over nine days under it court, under oath, and they couldn't contest one fact. So the evidence is clear. It's, what I'm telling you is the truth. So we are up on time, Tim, but I want to just tell you a couple of comments. So we had Jewel saying Prof Noakes is just the best. Aye. Andy says he's the advert. I guess that was might have been in reference to you and your your CrossFit, <laughs> your God. CrossFit scores. Um, where can people find you? And remind us about the the new book title, The Law yeah, of Nutrition. It's the Law of Nutrition. So that's the story of what happened to me over the last seven years since the since I converted, and then the last four years where I went through the trial. And it's really a story of the trial. And I, then I finish up with two two chapters on the evidence, most of which we presented at the trial. Mm -hmm. to show that we were once healthy and we are now unhealthy. And the only thing that's changed is the diet. And if we want to be healthy, we've got to cut the carbs and eat more fat and eat more, get rid of the processed food and eat real foods. So they can contact me through the Noakes Foundation, which we have our website. Yeah. The Noakes Foundation, and you're on Twitter? Yes, well. at Prof it's Tim Noakes. At Prof Tim Noakes. And um, I just want to say thank you. And Facebook, because I'm sorry that we didn't, get through all of your questions um, but you can follow Tim and probably tweet him tweet him some questions if you've got any exactly. uh, more about his journey and how he came to this way of thinking thank you for joining us and if you like this uh, hit the like button and then you'll get notified when we go live next time bye 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 bye